Welcome, um, everybody, back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Great Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan, where um, the sun at the moment is shining and the leaves are coming out and the magnolia trees and the cherry trees are on bloom in Park Avenue. And uh, But still, we are, uh, in a way, still in the middle of our COVID crisis and we are still wondering um, so deeply what is happening to our field, the field of the performing arts, the theaters, also music. We had to get some um, presenters here, was music, and we have to really uh, look forward. Uh, but in order to do that, to understand where we are and where we are going, we also need um, to um, look at uh, what has happened. And we, uh, today we have two speakers with us who have a lot of experience, who have watched uh, and have been part of what New York makes New York, of the scene, of the cultural scene, of the arts, and two uh, creators, presenters, and we at the Siegel and the idea of a Joseph Boyce, who says they are curators, artists, and themselves, they collage things, they make things possible, they invited artists, and they have done so um, in a way, uh, I think they are a role model, and um, they have been pioneers uh, in the field, and there's a lot of, to learn from them and I cannot wait to hear also how they see the situation at the moment, what they think will happen, but also what should happen. And um, I know that for all of us, the time of Corona has been a time of looking inward, um, of um, understanding uh, better who we are, but also about the place where we live, the country, the city. And we all know things have to change. It's time for a change. Maybe it already has changed, but we need to understand that we are so close. And conversations like this, small contribution, but also a big one. They change us while we do this, but also you listen to it and it, it's like traveling. It, uh, it changes us bit by bit and we become different because of it. And I'm really honored um, to have with us today, uh, Rachel Cooper and Elizabeth Hayes. So, First of all, welcome both of you and thank you for, for taking the time. I, I say a few words about them because as often um, uh, arts organizers, arts presenters are a bit more in the background than the artists. For us, we see that in the same um, level of uh, deep engagement. They are both women in the field often also um, not as much, I think, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the spotlight as uh, it should be, and um, but they have been part of a change in that, and they're so highly, highly respected in the field nationally and internationally. So it's great to have them with us. So about Rachel, Rachel Cooper is a, has a great and an extensive experience in traditional, but also contemporary Asian and Asian American performing arts, and uh, she has been at the very center of the development and the presentation and the understanding of it and also what art, uh, what functions in the society we are in. She has presented and commissioned over 800, uh, close to a thousand performances at the Asia Society. And I really would like to take that also. This is a real uh, body of experience uh, in, uh, not, but not only at the Asia Society where she works, but across the US. And she has worked with international artists from Indonesia, Iran, Cambodia, India, Pakistan, Philippines, Japan, China, Taiwan, and many, many others. And it has been also inspiration for us for the Siegel Talk to stay global and all the artists uh, who we present. And Rachel also has followed our work and also has suggested, uh, you know, that the presence of these artists, you know, is, is there and, and reminded us and also helped us and connected us. So we would like to thank her um, for that. She's a frequent participant, major conferences and a commentator on the media addressing international arts exchange and culture as diplomacy, her passion is sharing artists' voices with audiences broadly and to facilitate artist meetings at a global level. She co-directed this very, very significant initiative uh, of Muslim Voices Arts and Ideas Festival with BAM and the Asia Society and the Asia Society's Creative Voices and Muslim Asia Initiative. So you can see this is a, a pioneering a work, what she uh, did here. I don't know of any organization that, that dealt so deep, deep um, in it, like seals, as they say in the ocean, sometimes they go so very deep and we do not know. <laughs> and, uh, but she went, did that and it's, uh, we are better for it. She uh, lived in Indonesia in the 80s 
And there she organized, of course, festivals and performances. She's a co-founder and former director of the San Francisco-based Balinese music and dance company, Gamelan Sekajaya. And uh, she has been presenting the arts of Bali, especially in the United States for a very, very long uh, time. And Elizabeth Hayes, who is uh, like Rachel, also part of the landscape, you know, the formations, you know, you would be in, uh, in, in uh, any place in Europe and you see mountains and cities and, uh, and uh, rivers. So both of them would be part of the mountains uh, and rivers um, of that great, great landscape here in New York City where we are, makes New York who we are. She uh, was based in Paris and worked internationally in arts management, production and programming for 30 years and Elizabeth has been very kind and gentle with us. She hasn't listed all of it, but it is significant, it's major. And she worked uh, with George Strayler, the great, great George Strayler, many see him as one well, of the greatest theater artists ever at the Piccolo uh, in Italy. She worked with Peter Brook. Um, she has brought Ariam Nushkin over also as a close uh, collaborator with her. She worked with John Cage, uh, Daniel Barenboim, in dance with Merce Cunningham, uh, Carolyn Carlson, and Pina Bausch, names that are, are part of the Olymp uh, in a way of our field. And she has worked with great institutions like the Opera National de Paris, Teatro La Fenice, uh, Theater de Jean Elysees, and the Festival Balbec, uh, uh, Berlin Festspiele, and uh, and it is a uh, just a stunning engagement over decades. Um, she also worked for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for 13 years, and then she was the executive director of a very significant foundation that is also at the very heart of what we do here, the FAS of FACE, F-A-C, Foundation in New York City that really encourages, promotes, and truly supports on a grand scale, an international exchange of arts, science, of ideas and, um, and uh, keeps uh, that historic centuries long connection between uh, France and the Americas, and especially America, North America, the US um, alive. Now she's working on several projects uh, with a number of European theaters, especially as they involved in Palermo in Italy, this Teatro Biondi, and she was uh, uh, with us when we um, had um, theater artists from Palermo and with that, so um, I apologize for uh, making this so long, but this is important to know what they say carries weight. It is significant. It is important. And um, so both of you, thank you, thank you for coming. Where are you now? Are you, uh, uh, where in the world are you? Are you traveling? Are you in New York? Where I'm here in New York. Uh, the, the, um... There's a bit of an administrative delay for my work visa for Italy. So I've been working with the Teatro Biondo uh, Palermo, primarily with them, uh, remote from New York. So New York City and probably not so very far from wherever you are. Rachel? And I'm physically in New York and uh, mentally in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> that says it beautifully. So how are you both in these days, in this time of Corona? Rachel, shall you go first or shall I? You go first. Okay. Well, I'm doing well because we all have to do as well as we can and, and we must keep hope. And we know that at some point we're going to get to the end of this story, the end of this saga, the end of this, end, whatever one chooses to call it. And, um, you know, you can choose to be hopeful or be desperate. And there have been moments of both. But for the moment, I'm feeling positive and hopeful. I think I, like many other people, I believe I didn't expect that it might go on so long with this degree of intensity and, and unknown. But here we are. You know, you have to deal, you have to play with the cards that you've been dealt and not, uh, not the ones that you would have wished you have had. And I, I think from my standpoint, it's it's been a real time of reflection. And interestingly, because of you know the fact that my office and my living room are one and the same, uh, the time zone differences are are experienced a little differently. So I can talk to people in Asia at, at any time. And um, and one of the things that has been really interesting is the connection with my colleagues and friends 
in, in a variety of different countries. And it's whether it's with WhatsApp or Zoom, uh, the, the ability to connect with each other and the hunger for people to connect across regions is really palpable. And that's something I feel. And, and I also feel like new stories are emerging that's coming out of this period because we're in Corona, because we're in a, a moment of isolation and there's a hunger for figuring out which connections are the ones that are essential. Well said, yeah. You know, Frank, if I may add, uh, yeah. I believe you know I'm rather a fan of Siegel Talks, so I've heard quite a few and I may quote one or two people, but I think it was one of the earlier ones could it have been Carl Hancock Rooks who said what I think a lot of us are thinking, what, when, when the pandemic does indeed ebb and activity and we are feeling more free and safe to be in active circumstances once again. And I cringe at the word, you know, going back or going back to normal. I don't think we're going backwards to anything. I hope not. But wasn't it Carl Hancock's Rooks who said, you know, if, if people are wanting to go back to normal, if that's what is the priority in people's minds, maybe we will have missed the lesson completely, you know, missed the boat. And I think that reiterates what Rachel said, this is a time when we can be silent and listen and, and, and re-examine. Usually everyone is just so busy and so active and doing things all the time. There, there isn't this, I have to call it opportunity because it is one. What do you both think of the moment? How concerned are you, Rachel? Maybe we start with you. I think um, I think we're at a, a, I hate to say pivot point since that's become one of those trendy words, but in fact, there is some kind of a continuity that has to do with uh, the coming together of, of this moment. And, and COVID-19 just uh, amplified it. But, but the, uh, you know, the fact that there's the kind of climate change that's very real that we are that we are um, dealing with right now. The fact that the the kind of racism and and um, and systemic problems, societal problems, are have have a real light shine shown on them. That I think is not only it is America and it is our history. But it is not only in America. We're, we're talking about massive um, systemic inequalities that, that are uh, across the, the globe. We're talking about migration in, you know, 100 million people who are trying to find home or, or move around. So, so the questioning of what is a nation state and what is our nationality and what is our culture comes to the fore. That was a long-winded one, but anyway. No, 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 but it's perfect. And if I may add, and Rachel and I had a brief conversation yesterday or this morning, the, you know, if ever, uh, if ever a fact was brought to home, it was the fact that COVID-19 made us all instantly understand that we're all interconnected, interdependent. I think, and we, I, many, many people, Rachel certainly thinks that that's the case for climate change, but perhaps there were more people who didn't want to or who are not admitting that. And we also spoke briefly this morning, the, the result of the court case in Minneapolis for George Floyd, uh, that also I think is a moment, we, is a moment that's brought us all together and, real, and we realize to what extent we are all so interconnected. And the racism in this country that is just you know, has, has jumped out in such a way that, that uh, is not to be denied and was there, but was perhaps denied in the past. And I was interested to see, and Rachel, I'm sure you saw this in the part of the world that you're so familiar with, that the verdict in Minneapolis also yesterday was the headline in the French, the German, the Italian, the newspapers and so forth. We're, so uh, this, this, the COVID situation I think has brought to the fore so dramatically a point that we should have been aware of, you know, so much earlier. 
how how we are so interconnected in everything we do. I think jumping into um, the the arts world, the live arts, which is which is our passion. Um, what I feel is that there are many new stories and new ways of telling stories that are being explored, and the uh, the new technology has foregrounded some of that. So so we have some very young, phenomenal storytellers who are working in music, theater, poetry, uh, and we have an intergenerational um, kind of meeting ground that's quite interesting. And and if there's anything, if I if I do say so, that I think we need to really um, support it's it's the telling of history. It's how we understand history uh, beyond, you know, those old textbooks. Mm. Need to be jettisoned. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And another thing that I've been struck by, and it has to do with a couple of projects I'm working on and, and many other projects that I've been sort of witnessing and listening to, is this, this period when we're, there's an opportunity to listen um, I'm so interested by some of these projects that are working on the basis of small individual increments. But when you look at the entirety of it, it's extraordinary. And just a fantastic New York City example, uh, Frank, you spoke the other day with John Glover, who's with the Kaufman uh, Music Center. And since late January, they've been doing these pop-up concerts that are called musical storefront performances because we've all seen how many empty storefronts there are. So on a given day, and it's almost every day of the week at 11, 12, and 1 p.m., uh, there's an artist or a group of two or three artists who give a performance in a storefront, but it's not pre-announced, but simply People hear sound and hear music and are drawn to that location. And a crowd of 10, 15, 50, or 100 people may gather for a performance of about 40 minutes. And then there's a break and it begins again. And then there's a second round at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m. All right. Each individual performance may be 40 minutes. It may gather 50 or 60 people spontaneously. You know, no one knows it's to, it's to happen. But if you look at this together, I think John told you, Frank, that over the period, because they're going on until late April, I think that there have been, first of all, all of the artists are engaged and paid, and they're paid a decent fee. I don't know what the numbers are. That That's not my, uh, uh, that's secondary as far as I'm concerned. What's in, what is not secondary is that they're all being paid. And they, I think that they've employed more than 470 artists. And there have been thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who've gathered. And every single performer has said, I can't tell you how exciting or how moving it is to perform live for live people. And spontaneously, the people who gather talk to one, again, one another. They make you know films. The little children go right up to the window like this. But the spontaneity of it, the joy of attending a performance. But again, small increments. But look at what this is mm. in the accumulation of the period of time since they've been doing it. Food for thought. Close, close to 20,000 people, I think. Um, numbers they would normally leverage. Both of you, do you think this will be a radical moment of presenting in a different way? Will, will the lessons or what we learn or think about, will that be implemented? I think it's going to be plus plus. At a, a, you know, there are all kinds of concerns which are budgetary, financial, safety, travel, the idea of simply import, export, and you know there is the whole factor of climate change and carbon, uh, carbon imprint. But I think that this possibility of online performance has opened up new windows that obviously can include greater numbers of people and people in many different geographical locations. I think that live performance will always be live performance and that's absolutely unique. But I think and certainly hope that lots of people are taking advantage of this possibility in terms of imagination and programming to you know, expand 
the the ideas of how work can be presented in addition to live performance. Rachel, I'm sure you will express yourself much better than I just did along the. You know. Oh, that was great. Um, that was very, very well put. And I would just add to it. Um, I think there are changes that we're not even aware of. And some of those changes are kind of high. Uh, there's a combination of, of live in person, people to people, as well as interactive work that is going on uh, through the internet. And, and I think it's a mixture. And I, I also think that people are finding ways to do storytelling that brings in the audience. In, in some ways, we already were seeing that with, with some of the storytelling platforms that have become so popular over the last 10 years, whether you're talking about TEDx or, or you're talking about um, the moth, you're also talking about the way that we craft narrative. And we're talking about the ways that it empowers people to tell their own narratives. And the place that I think there will be a big change and I'm very happy about is within the idea of international. I mean, I think it's very important that you support local artists, but I don't think that precludes the kind of international exchange that is crucial to having what I think is a real civil society. And, uh, and we now have some of the mechanisms to do that. And, and what I would hope is that when we think about the ethics of that, that that includes a, a new way of thinking about gatekeepers. And maybe that mm -hmm. responds to what you were saying, Elizabeth. In some ways, presenters have been a certain kind of gatekeeper. This is what we think our audience will like. And, uh, and I had an experience years ago with the Festival of Indonesia, which was Indonesian artists really defining what they wanted to share, not the bureaucrats, the artist. And it really changed the way I thought about international interaction and no. how we bring artists to, uh, to share with each other. Really, I mean, we're facilitators. Absolutely. I see myself as the person in the wings and uh, really the artists and the work, absolute priority start to finish. Absolutely. If I may give another example, because I think it's an interesting example of, 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 a, of a project and also in terms of using technology and the whole thing about how geography is and travel is so restricted. I am delighted to be able to be working with Pamela Villoresi, who was named director of the Teatro Biondo in Palermo. And Frank, as you mentioned, you interviewed her and the extraordinary mayor of the city of Palermo, Leo Luca Orlando, a few months back. And we are working with Irina Brook on a project which is called The House of Us. There has been over a period of time and, and pre-COVID as well, a phenomena of young people who become, I think the pathology would be internet addicts and they you know, isolate themselves from society. And in extreme cases, communicate exclusively through social media and they literally don't leave their rooms and their houses. In Japan, there's a word for it, which is called hikikomori, which I learned as I began to work on this project. So the project is the following. Irina was, was alarmed, but fascinated by this idea. And she spent a little bit of time in Japan and she is working with us in Palermo for the first iteration of House of Us, which will go on to be developed in other theaters in other cities. And what it involves is, her working online digitally, uh, spending time one-on-one -on -one with young people. Now, in fact, she is working with a few young people in Palermo who are past cases of hikikomori and one young man who is involved in the pathology of hikikomori, but mostly she's working with the brilliant young students of the school of the Teatro Biondo, who by the circumstances of COVID and lockdown, they themselves involuntarily found themselves isolated from one another and from the world during the period of time in various countries where there was lockdown. So she was able to maintain her work digitally and she will come now, come to Palermo in late May. So one by one, she is working with individuals and these young people are telling, Rachel, here's your point, telling their stories of how they experienced 
this period of lockdown and she's interested in making and has been making short films, short video films. And in fact, this will eventually develop into a, a kind of presentation to the public, but let's not call it a production or a public performance where the public is able to enter into a space and there will be screens and they it will be, you know, they will move around. It won't be a sit down, see a performance. Well, but this is the first chapter, Palermo Laboratory. And then she is working also, this is a co-production initially. She's working with the Teatro La Pergola in Florence and she has just been named resident director from the for the Teatro Stabile in Veneto in Venice area which is three theaters but this this may go on for several years and yeah. in each case she will be working so this is about individual stories that are to be perceived and heard individually but then gradually things are woven together in each place so again forgive me long story oh, long I think the daughter she daughter of Peter Brook right um, she and she's in, you know, family business. Um, Rachel, um, you are monitoring the Asian uh, scene so closely and, um, and we also had many of them. Actually, we're going to have uh, uh, Milati Shoyodarmo with us, uh, I think, tomorrow from Indonesia. But uh, what, what do you see in a, what are ideas, what can we learn from um, uh, examples like Elizabeth just shared? Well, I'm excited that you have Malati Surya Dharma. So let me just say that that's an artist I have worked with and I'm a big fan of her, her work and vision. And she's the kind of artist who really transcends boundaries. So I'm, I'm uh, excited that you're, you're presenting her. She's part of our triennial. We have a triennial of Asian art at the Asia Society uh, titled, We Don't Dream Alone. And interestingly, her piece is about dreaming. So it's quite appropriate. Uh, and so I have to make the plug, you know, for for some of the of course. the exhibition, which is up through June, which is all contemporary work, and some new performance pieces with uh, Samita Sinha and Suzy Ibarra. But uh, you asked specifically about about some of the things that I'm seeing in Asia, and it's really tough. I, I was on the phone earlier with um, artists in Colombia, and uh, they're in full lockdown right now. And some of the, the new work that people were creating uh, has had to, to take a, um, a halt temporarily. And, you know, a lot of places that, where you can't have the audiences there and they're not about technology, it makes it really difficult. That said, I see a lot of artists who are connecting across the region. And I would be remiss if I don't bring up one of the most, both horrendous and creative uh, moments in history. And I don't think they're very well known. What's going on in Burma, Myanmar right now, the coup that started on February 1st. Mm -hmm. If you are tracking this, you see that artists have been making work, incredible amount of work. And the internet is shut down now. And the protests in themselves are, are a kind of theater. You know, every day there's another kind. So on Easter, that was like, everyone puts eggs out. On another day, it's everyone is paint your shoes and put red shoes out. You know, in a very violent situation, the collective um, response is actually incredibly creative. And a lot of young people are saying things like, you, you, you uh, selected the wrong generation to monkey around with. And, and so I just, I, I keep thinking about that because whether it's hip hop artists, performance artists, uh, in that particular situation, which is so dire, the response is creative on so many levels. So it's, it's interesting, you know, you have a generation of artists and you have collective, I was talking with Malati yesterday about the fact that there is a collective of contemporary artists around the world who are coming together in support of the artists and people of Myanmar. So, you know, how people are making their artistic efforts beyond 
productions is really interesting and, and I think important to track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, Frank, if I may, I'd love to ask Rachel a question because uh, she's had so much experience in an area that I have not at all, and I'm not talking about geography. During the course of my work and, and continue to do so, I, I have had the great good fortune of working with composers, choreographers, and so, but mostly people creating new work. So recent work, new work, and I love that. And that's also the case of Rachel. You mentioned the extraordinary number of commissions. The other thing that Rachel has been so involved in that I'm fascinated with is she is so expert and she has also presented parallel traditional work. And I'm so struck now by how relevant from a contemporary point of view, how relevant traditional work is as well. And I would love it, Rachel, if you could just speak about that a little bit because you spoke about history, how history is told and you have so much experience in this in terms of the performing arts, could you? Could you speak about that? Thank you for the question, Elizabeth. Uh, you know, there's a kind of false binary of this is contemporary and this is traditional. And traditional is therefore old and you re respond to it in X way. And it, it's always done this way. You know, I, I think about Legong in, in Bali and someone will say this timeless piece of art has been done for eons in Bali. However, I'm a dance ethnologist. That that piece was created in uh, you know the late 1800s, and the the way it's being done now was in the 1930s. And updates you know continue. So it's not like things are are um, stuck in stone, especially if you're in the live arts. We're we're not talking about a statue that we we discovered. It's not to say we aren't inspired by it, but there, there's amazing art making going on that's come out of different cultures that, that um, is really profoundly uh, moving. And when people wanted to share it, not all things are meant to be shared, but some of them people do want to share. And uh, there are ways that by presenting it in outside of its own culture, you actually can be part of helping to because that appreciation uh, can can enhance it in in its own uh, situation. So I mm. uh, we brought a group from North Sumatra uh, of Batak uh, Toba musicians. And the governor said, why are you bringing this? We, we need MTV, beautiful women. We presented it, it was a huge hit in America. When they went back, the governor said, I never realized this was art. I, you know, I had the same thing in, in uh, Burma. Mm -hmm. I said, have you looked, have you heard how amazing this music is? And he's like, our music, no, 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 we should be doing hip hop. I said, listen to, everyone has hip hop. Nobody has a, a sign line. Nobody has this, listen. And, it, and so there's an interesting global moment where those things that are that are shared. And again, I you know it has to do with appropriacy and the people who are are owners of those traditions wanting to do that. But being able to share that and share it as part of our living culture of today, not 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 this is traditional and this is this is contemporary. Not that there isn't some hybrid moment, but, but it, that's the beauty of live arts. That's the beauty of live arts because they're living in the moment and they're always being re, reinvented. Even, even ancient traditions are being reinvented in a live moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, marvelous. Yeah, yeah, no, this is quite significant in this moment of contemporary art where we live in this hybrids uh, that we experience that we don't see also as any um, um, contradiction, you know, follow a, a very beautiful traditional art and a very highly conceptual modern um, art piece that it collaborates and, um, and and that it informs each other and that, you know, even the project of modernity, you know, was part of a tradition and an adaptation of a tradition when a new technology 
it came in and all of a sudden something changed, which we're experiencing now at the moment. And it's important that region of Asia, um, United Nations lists even, I think, Turkey is Western Asia, I think Israel. I mean, you presented work from uh, the Khorasan region in Iran, you know, and all of these, what we, we do not know enough. It's shocking how little we know. Why do both of these a question? And, and I mean it in a serious way, and we often talk about it, it's taken for granted, art is important, has an impact, but what impact does it really have? What impact does global work really have, and why is it important? And you've been in the field, so like, an honest answer, What? Why is that? Why do we need it? First of all, I think so many of the troubles in the world stem from ignorance, lack of, well, let's from on the scale of lack of familiarity to ignorance, as, as you've just said. I think hopefully we all want to be better people day by day. And I think the performing arts in all of their shapes and sizes and forms and from everywhere in the world, I think they help us be better people and, uh, and open our, our eyes to our own personal experience. And the more narrow the path that we follow, I think the more narrow will be our minds and our hearts. And the, I think, wasn't it Olga Garay who said just the other day, you know, the lack of festivals in this country and because of the lockdown and, and so forth and so on. And she, she spoke to that for a minute. But I, I think it's absolutely critical that we can citizens of the world. And how can we do that if we are not, if we don't maintain our curiosity and to whatever extent we can, our, our, familiarity with, with others and the work of others around the world. Well said, I, I, think, um, I think we sometimes think that it's, we buy in, we, I don't know which we we mean, but, but sometimes those of us working in the arts uh, unconsciously buy into this idea that um, that we are we are the entertainment side, or we're we're there to to infuse knowledge or wisdom, or you know, it it has some very sometimes narrowing ways of being understood. So I thought I'd give a couple of of concrete examples that I've I've experienced in terms of that impact. So one is when we had uh, with Zeba Rahman, I worked on a a project that was uh, that brought Sufi musicians to New York City with mm -hmm. a UN ambassador, Ambassador Hussein. And we brought the superstar, the great Sufi master, Abda Parveen, and she performed in Union Square. This was after that attempted uh, bomber in Times Square. So the response mm -hmm. was, okay, we have a different side of Pakistan that we want to share with you. So we did this, we had about 5,000 people. The next day, or maybe it was a couple weeks later, there was, there was a huge flood in Pakistan. And I got, and we were doing fundraisers and I got a, an email from someone I didn't know who said, I want to tell you that I have just donated to this cause. Why? Because I never cared about Pakistan. I cared about India because I knew Ravi Shankar. That, but after I heard of the Parveen, it humanized, it made Pakistan a place that I cared about. And then when something happened to that place, I wanted to donate and I, like I needed to tell you. Mm -hmm. That's story number one. Story number two is when I was in Iran with the vice president of Iran. And the, the first, I was there twice. And the first time he said, you know, why are you here? Our countries don't like each other. I said, well, because I work in music. And uh, our countries yell at each other. You know, we, we throw uh, uh, didactic pronouncements, but we don't listen. I said, in music, it's all about listening. And uh, Iranians can be very philosophical, so he nodded. I went back the next year and he said, I've been thinking about this for a year and I've decided Islam can accept music. And I'd like to know, you know, how we can help. We want more better understanding. And uh, could we do something using traditional lullabies? You know, here's somebody who's in government, who's trying to find a way in. And music provided something 
that could be neutral. And the, and the third thing I'll say briefly had to do with the military. I was asked to give a talk to the military, the defense university, to people, soldiers, high level soldiers who are about to go to Pakistan and Afghanistan. And my entire talk was about what are you gonna talk about after you're negotiating a deal? The arts are not about a deal. It's about understanding the culture and some appreciation. And again, it was one of those situations where the following year, somebody came up and said, thank you for, for pushing me to understand the culture better. I had a different set of relationships because I could have different kinds of conversations. So those are, those are yeah. key examples. Brilliant, absolutely. They're, they're, you know, each one is idiosyncratic, I suppose, but I think we if you multiply it by millions. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, as a New Yorker, and Frank, you're certainly aware of this, when I was working those years with Face Foundation, which is an American nonprofit with a partnership, an official partnership with French Cultural Services, I think how many people in the arts in this town and in the country are aware of French Cultural Services? Quite a few, because I think France has really understand that cultural diplomacy is real. It is a real tool. And Rachel has been working with this forever. I consider it something that's absolutely vital. Um, when people can't find the words to say things, there can still be music and dance and uh, performance, the live arts living, you know, the performing arts, live performing arts are critical for that. Yeah. You know, yeah, what's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. ahead. No, it's interesting in, in Sicily with the extraordinary work that Pamela Villoresi is doing at the Biondo. She very much is making a point also of working with Sicilian artists. And there is such a wealth of artists, musical and so forth, some traditional, many, many contemporary. So that, again, this model we referred to, well, model, there's the, the idea that we referred to earlier as, you know, presenting in the past, having often been based on things simply being ex in, imported from elsewhere. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting as we all move forward to, to, to see how the involvement of the community, not simply in terms of giving lip service, but really activating you know, finding, creating valid relationships and activating relationships within the, within the communities. And I think extraordinary things can come of that. Slightly sidebar, but not too far. No, 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 that, that is true. That's important. And I think uh, it is interesting that this art and music, uh, is something that does in a way to truly um, unite it. And perhaps also is a way, I think Edouard Louis from France said, you know, I don't write my place for people who, already, uh, you know, understand our life for those people who don't, this is what I'm fighting for. And he said, mm -hmm. this, the problem is with this uh, engagé that, you know, hammers home a point. He always says, no, I care about the people who don't like me, who hate me, you know, you know to do something. And someone said about the New York Times that uh, people, some people read the business section on the style, style section, some will read, you know, the uh, metro section, but, not they don't read everything but everybody looks at the art pages mm. so what's in there is a magnifying you know for a country to be represented also you know it's it is something so a, a question to both of you and perhaps even a bit more to rachel um because of the violence against asians and asian americans which we are experiencing um, um, but for both of you you have presented global international work we talked about racism before did you encounter in your work uh, in uh, facilitating and executing, you know, did, did, did you experience moments where you said, you know, this would be an American artist or a British artist that wouldn't have happened? Is there, is there something in American culture that uh, pays perhaps is a little bit more lip serving than real service, or is it an open system that actually says, yes, we need that? Rachel, definitely go first. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have been doing more international exchange um, at various levels than is shared with the, the overall society in the US, number one. So I, I want to say that, that 
the informal sector has been really important. This country has different um, communities and often they will bring in artists from from countries from that they have their their roots in and they won't go to the the other other parts of the country well that is also a part of american culture and i think that's not always understood i mean these these new demographic quote unquote new demographics this is new this this has been a part of one part of the society, and it's not very well um, told as a narrative of the, of the country. But I, I think that's, that's really true. And one place where I do think um, you start to see it going way back is in jazz. Jazz has been an important part of, of this country, coming out of blues and, and gospel and the African uh, tradition going back hundreds of years, but, but really, at, you know, over the last hundred years and becoming a form that came out of African American culture and then became something that was shared more broadly. And so you have Asian American musicians who are very involved with jazz and also great allies in, in various activism and coalition. And that, that really goes back a very long time. So I, I think I think there are aspects of the culture and what we say is American culture uh, that that is that is narrow. It doesn't it doesn't really reflect the, the interesting and and broad swath of of who are Americans. Elizabeth. Excellent. You know, I don't think I have anything really terribly valid to add to that because my perspective is a little bit uh, different because when I moved to France, I wasn't involved specifically with an American community or American, you know, specifically an American identity. I did have the delight, the honor and the, and the great good luck to work with Merce Cunningham and John Cage and Paul Taylor and, and then Carolyn Carlson over the years. Um, I think what's interesting to look at is the situation here now. And again, Frank, maybe this is not exactly target to your question. What A, I'm alarmed about a number of things, which is the survival of institutions here because of the extraordinarily uh, catastrophic financial situation. Obviously, the, the well-being of individual artists who have remained without work for so long. And I, again, referring to what Olga Garay said the other day, there is a lack of ongoing presentation of international work in this country, which is quite radically different from what happens in Europe where there are festivals and festival seasons. And even without that, it's so easy. It has been in the past so easy to travel from one place to another. So A, the importance of how the, the world of digital uh, presentation can be developed so that it be something which is not just technical, but can have a value artistically. And then we will see in the next year or two or three, I think it's going to take some time, how live performances can take place and how international exchange can take place once again. Again, in Palermo, the, what we're working on now, it's more a question of one or two artists coming and working on a workshop basis, pause, workshop, pause, and the development of a piece, rather than the idea of spotting a terrific production of which, you know, I hope once again, obviously there will be many, and importing. So again, Frank, apology if that's not exactly responding to your question, but it, it's a point that, that's very much in the forefront of my mind now. And I'd like to continue with that thought, Elizabeth, because I think this idea of what we mean by international, and, and again, referencing Olga's conversation, because she talked about La Red, which was a, a network, uh, I think she said originally funded by Rockefeller, was it? Ford. Yeah. Ford. Yeah. Okay, Ford, originally funded by, yeah. by one of the two biggies. <laughs> Um, who are who are by the way not doing this work in the same way at the moment? That's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. However, 
what I think is crucial about that is that, that gave voice to people in the region to be able to represent themselves and to think about that as a part of a network. So as we go forward and we're looking at new models, this idea of networks and, and how, how the conversations develop so that they're less, they're less um, narrow, you know, I like you, let me sign a contract. And there are some big questions that can be discussed on a regional level is an exciting potential, I think. Uh, and, I, you know, for example, I mean, this hasn't really worked. There was an Asian um, arts network for a long time. They really focused on contemporary work. There was one out of Hong Kong as well. And the Cambodian Living Arts Group, uh, Pun Krim's work, which I think might be something you want to consider having on your program. Uh, that idea of, of connecting across the region and then, and then be, being able to have a conversation with a number of people within the region. It's like being multinational, you know, multilateral. It, mm -hmm. I think that we are at a, a, an exciting time where we can look at new, um, new, new system. And this could be, it doesn't have to be regional. It can be on a, on a topic like land use or, or water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Frank, if I may add, and again, it's more parallel than directly mm -hmm. related to what uh, Rachel just added. I thought it was so interesting when you had very recently Peja Muzayevich, who's the artistic administrator at Brezhnikov Art Center and also Tippett Rise. And he spoke about the entirety of the experience of a performance. In other words, if we're talking about a live performance, when you walk in the building, when you, you know, your first encounter may be with the ticket window or it may be with the usher and the entirety of experience from beginning to end influences each of us. It is, I was about to say, not just, I mean, not just the performance when the house lights dim and the performance takes place and there's applause and the house lights go up again. And I think it is interesting and not too many people perhaps are doing this, but I think it's interesting, uh, the institutions and the individuals who are presenting work online, when there is thought given to every aspect of it. And particularly there, in, there are a few musical organizations where there's real thought being given to the visual aspect of presenting musical performance. And BAC certainly is one of the terrific examples. And the Orchestra of St. Luke's had several concerts recently that they called Sounds and Stories. And again, like BAC, they work with the lighting designer and so forth so that visually it was a striking, striking performance. I think the, the, time, the time span of a performance in terms of, the, of an individual, of one's concentration, can be so different from when we're sitting in a space with others sharing a performance. I think it's important to be, for any of us who are involved in presenting, to be very aware of that as well. Yeah, that is interesting. Themes that do emerge is that the network is important. Perhaps developing something locally instead of only flying, in, you know, the, the, the companies. Um, small, small engagements, but also thinking in multilateral as uh, racial in, 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 in uh, regions and structures and in, uh, in global connections. And we all know that the, the, the fight against racism, uh, the violence against women, uh, homophobia, uh, all that, they are global problems like uh, um, climate change. You know, it cannot be done by one nation. It's not one nation's fault or responsibility. We need that. And the, I think the arts have been, we have to be at the forefront also as a symbol, as a imaginary space, a symbolic space, but for that moment also as a real space to say, this is what we have to think about. And that's why we, you know, had Milo Rao often here on that program that there are, um, that there are artists, you know, help us to, to, to think that through and have good, good questions. Um, to both of you, um, what can we learn? What can we learn from uh, the Asian artists? What are lessons? I mean, we have people who listen in, also young uh, professionals, graffiti artists, but also people, people who are here who work, people who work in art administration or from Europe. 
what can we learn? What are lessons where you say this is important, it's basic, but perhaps overlooked, something that even Corona made clearer? Rachel. Well, I don't know that, you know, I have to say the word Asia is, is such a strange one because the idea that somehow Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, China, India, Pacific Island, you know, it, 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 the, there's something wrong with the terminology in some ways, I must say. And, and I wouldn't generalize, but I can say that there are lessons to learn everywhere you go and with various ways that artists work. So I'll bring, I'll bring up Java as one example in Indonesia because art, I mean, it's true in, in other parts of Indonesia true, but there's something about collective work and a lot of really interesting work is too large to, to quote unquote bring because it's so inclusive. And so, and it's really about, uh, often about creating work together, you know, so not, not always, but there is, there is a lot of working together and a lot of people who want to join in. So that's-, that's Could you give one thing. example? Could you give one example? Sure. Um, I'm thinking of, um, oh, I'm trying to think of this big theater project that happened in Jakarta and, and the name is just escaping me. But when we were trying to do Festival of Indonesia, it was very hard because so many of these pieces, I think Putu Wijaya's work, for example, uh, there, were, there were literally, you know, 30, 40 people involved in the production. No, no one was getting paid. Maybe they were gaining one roko, which was like, you know, enough to buy a cigarette, <laughs> getting lunch. But, but it wasn't about that. It was about working on, on things together. And I don't mean to idealize it. And I'm not saying that there aren't artists who are working on their own. But there is, there is a hunger to work together. There is something about being social and creating mm -hmm. art together that, that can be really powerful. And, and the eye to that is also a certain kind of confidence that some of the artists have. So that's why I brought up that example early on when the, when the Indonesian uh, former foreign minister wanted to do a festival of Indonesia, a very large group of the artists went to him and said, we'd like to be able to define that. And the big part of it was he said, okay. Hmm. So if hmm. I think about, you know, and, and subsequent uh, efforts have been different where, you know, a group of presenters came and they chose what they like or a group of bureaucrats said, oh, fashion shows will be big in America. That'll really do it. What, was, what had so much integrity was that, that the process, and that's why I brought up Lored too, the process of incorporating the artist not only in the art making, but in the art decision making and in thinking about representation becomes, I think, a real opportunity for, for a kind of equity that we can all learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, including the artists, uh, securing equity, and also the idea to participate that art is not done by experts for people to consume, the idea to collaborate and whether an experience together is uh, something that is, um, yeah. Really I mean, the artists, th this was a group of artists in, in 19, 1988 who were saying, we need to be, if we're representing Indonesia, we need to be talking about the environment and the rainforest. We need to be talking about religion of Islam. We need to be talking about children. We need to talk about urban. We need to talk about contemporary expression. This is, this is 30 some years ago. And they're already thinking in those terms that, that often people don't realize, you know, and they said, how do you represent a country? And I'm not sure of, that many of our dear bureaucrats would have come up with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So well said, so well said. And Frank, it came up again, I think when you were speaking with 
John Glover about having artists at the head or as part of the decision-making process for institutions. And Kaufman Music Center, that's very much the case. Again, I have the great good fortune to work with the Teatro Biondo Palermo and Pamela Villorese is a major actress and she's been involved in many things in terms of social causes, but she's an artist. This is the first time in her life that she has actually been responsible for running an institution. But to have the artist perspective, I mean, we, we see it in, in everything that's being done at the at the biondo and so yes what can we learn so many things yeah so, so you, many things what else is in europe from your experience basically at the moment where you see the, these are things that are working there and i wish it would be like this in new york what do you monitor well first of all uh and uh i have been so struck by the work that you have presented of milo rao his films but this film, theater, the way he combines this kind of work. I'm, we're another project that we have at Palermo that I think is extremely interesting and could be something very revealing in terms of the future is a collaboration with the Dance Theater of Wuppertal, Pina Bausch. One of her great, well, how many great works did she create? Innumerable. One of her great works and one of the first works done on the basis of residency in a city was called Palermo, Palermo. It was 31 or 32 years ago and it was created in the Teatro Biondo, in fact. And she came to Palermo with the company and they spent a certain amount of time there. I will add, it was very much at the instigation of and with the support of Leo Luca Orlando, the mayor of Palermo, who was mayor at the time, who was an extraordinary intellectual and, and deeply committed to the arts and all their in all their forms. And we are now, we Teatro Biondo, we are working with the Pina Bausch Foundation and the Tanze Hata Wuppertal, and over the course of several workshops, uh, four Wuppertal dancers at a time come to Palermo and work with young professionals, dancers, acrobats of their choice based on video and auditions. And over the course of a period of time, a work is going to be developed based on fragments of the original Palermo Palermo, but this will be a new piece because Palermo Palermo is a lengthy piece of over two hours, but this is going to be working with local or Sicilian mm -hmm. artists of various disciplines, doing in, in a creative process over a period of time that will resort in some work in progress or something presented to the public. But I think this is based on lessons we've learned and continue to learn. This began pre-COVID this work of how to work together in a different way, how to involve the community, how to involve the international world, you know, beyond our own, beyond our own uh, geographical setting. I'm fascinating. I'm so deeply involved. Better. Yeah. And I think it became even more clear now that, you know, the kind of a dialogue discourse was the history of the company, the history of the city, uh, to collect to, um, um, forces that are to be found on this space for artists to really spend time in the city and as Pina Bausch um, originally did. You also talked about, I think it was a, a French um, a theater that did telephone, uh, the, a telephone project. Oh, oh may I? May I, may I? Our, this is, oh, yeah. you know, our oh, theaters are closed, uh, uh, most of them, and we, we yeah. you know, uh, look at uh, what's happening and, uh, and they can't do so much, the public or New York theater workshop or the second shit, and so it's the signature, um, the vineyard and others. So what what did they do? And I think it was a popular, it became, a, became a, an important well, Again, stop me if I go on too long. One of your earlier guests was Emmanuel de Marcimota, who's the director of the Théâtre de la Ville and the Festival d'Automne. Yeah. He created, a, he's very deeply involved also in poetry. And he created a project about 10 years ago when he was at the Théâtre de Reims before he came to Théâtre de la Ville. But he's developed it now. And since a couple of months at the Théâtre de la Ville, they have been doing a program called Consultation Poétique. Now, in French, if you go to a doctor, you have a consultation médicale. So the idea is this is a consultation, but it's poétique. It's about poetry. And the following happens. Any member of the public signs up for free for a, you will receive a phone call at a certain date at a certain time. And this will be from an actor or an actress who's had a, a short little 
you know, I, you know, before becoming involved in this project has worked on, they, they have a short training session. And in fact, the, the, it's all, it's very much developed out of COVID and the conversation begins one-on-one. -on -one. So the person is anonymous in, in both directions. The, the conversations begin by, how are you? And the actor is, is really there to have a convers personal conversation with you and to listen. And during the course of maybe 10 or 15 minutes, there's a dialogue. We have a conversation. I've done this myself. And then the, the actor or actor says, now I would like to read you a poem. And during the course of the personal conversation, they have chosen from a group of, of poems what poem they think is most adapted to you. And then the conversation goes on for approximately 20, 25 minutes, and then it comes to an end. And at the end, after you conclude the conversation, you receive it within the next couple of days an ordonnance poétique. And in French, ordonnance is a prescription, as though it's a medical prescription. And you receive the, the copy of the poem that was chosen and was read to you. Now, in my case, and I'm sure it's the case of many other people as well, he, the actor whose name is Nicolas something, added another poem because we talked about travel and about being involved in the arts and travel. Now, here's the other thing about small increments becoming very large. This project started it now involves, first of all, the Terre de la Ville has partnerships in something like 14 different countries. Since the program began, there have been more than 14,000 consultations poétiques. They take place in 22 languages because of the partnerships in different countries, from Greece to Hungary to nine different countries in, in, uh, in Africa. And I'm working with the Terre de la Ville now. There may be a partnership with the New York Theater soon. So think of this, over 83 mm -hmm. actors be it throughout the partnerships in Paris and, and France and elsewhere, 22 different languages. And this is called the Troupe de l'Imaginaire and by now probably 15,000 consultations. I really urge anyone. There was a marvelous article in the New York Times. There might be a link on HowlRound because I sent that in earlier. Uh, anyone can sign up now. So you can sign up in English or French or whatever. I mean, and our it, listeners now, you listen into this, you can you know, find the link at the New York Times. Uh, indeed. Uh, and again, yeah, and when it, and when you spoke with Emmanuel de Massimota, he spoke about listening, about the important how he didn't want to rush to put up lots of material online. He thought he for him it was so important to have a period of listening. But but this consultation poetic project is extraordinary, extraordinary, incredible. Mm. These are great ideas. I think also in Reims, uh, in the, there was a, at the, um, at the um, theater engaged in a dialogue of a book on the history, the overlooked history of, um, of France by Philippe Boucheron, I think, uh, and they read yeah. parts of it. Uh, the, the, the book was already asked a hundred historians, say, what, is, what are parts of history we have overlooked that makes clear that France always has been, in a way like Palermo, a, a country of yeah. a multi yeah. uh, nationalities, of diverse influence. Right. There was never a France and, and they read it out, they engaged and um, and um, and so it, it, it is quite yeah. significant. If both of you, we have a bit over time already, but we have some. If let's say a Biden plan came up and which I think it should also be for um, for the arts, where I say we have to reinvent the structure is no longer holding, the bridges are crumbling, uh, but people need to get across, but in better ways, in new ways. In a time of the digital age, as we are here now, we always say at the seat of Brecht Road, for the children of the technological age, but now we have the children of the digital age, I say, and we have to do something different, our motor day, different times be different from what would both of you say, and maybe Rachel, we'll start for you, if you would be, um, as they had, um, not of the Fed, of the Feds, like, uh, you know, a ministry in, in Washington, but unfortunately there is no Ministry of Culture, but what would you prescribe? What would you say, this is, what we need, what would be your consultation medical for, uh, for the state of the arts in, in, the, in the US? What is urgent, what is significant? Well, I, I think as you know, I think it's urgent 
that there is reciprocity in the kind of exchange. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak more specifically towards culture as diplomacy in this moment. A uh, little bit louder, uh, Rachel. Yeah. Sorry. I think that um, culture as diplomacy really means reciprocity. And, and uh, you know, there's a, a project at State Department called Center Stage, which brings artists from outside of the United States here. You know, this is a first because before we only sent out American artists to represent America and the best of America. Yeah. In many ways by signaling that we have a mutual respect and that we bring people here, we're giving a very different message. So I think that's quite important, that kind of reciprocity and really thinking through, uh, you know, as we've heard over and over during this uh, hour, the idea of giving artists agency. And an agency meaning not only in the arts, but to speak more broadly because the, the kind of wisdom that they have to share is one that is relevant to our society in, in so many different ways. I couldn't say it any better. Speak to artists, listen to artists, listen, generally listen and involve the artists. Mm. Yeah, which is <clears throat> kind of a radical, um, so I think it happens a bit more maybe in Europe or in Asia, other countries. As far as I know, the board of Lincoln Center, uh, I think it has 86 board members. I, I think everybody can be one. You pay 350,000 or something. And um, not that you're really in charge. There's still a smaller group, but still there's no artist, of course, there. So. Um, it, it creates an atmosphere, an environment, you know, that then, you know, uh, it's different than perhaps uh, the good old days where I guess a Balanchine and a, a mm. Bernstein and, uh, you know, Elia Kazan, they, people would, they would know each other, talk to each other. Most probably this is no longer um, the case. And I think um, to, to, to open the institutions, I believe very much actually in institutions and artists and ideas have come to get together with existing ones, but they have to change. Um, mm -hmm. okay. What would you both say if there, you know, at, at the young Elizabeth who started out, I don't know exactly where, we don't have so much, I would love to, you know, also hear all both of your stories, but to the young Rachel and the young Elizabeth at moments when you had to make up your mind, where do I go to, is it really worth it? I dedicate my life to this? What, what are messages you would like to tell yourself or others who are listening now, what's, what's of importance, what should, what should well, be done? You know, I, I've been around for a while. And when I first went into the field, there, was, there weren't such things as arts management programs in the universities. And I admire very much that, that exists. But I must say, I cannot imagine any better way of learning than the old fashioned apprentice mentor. If you can, get involved with, you know, try to get into the team of an artist and institution. The smaller the institution, the better. The smaller the institution, the more nimble and do everything. There's nothing that's sort of above or below. Uh, I mean, every experience is a learning experience. So being involved, actively being involved in the trenches, uh, learning by doing, I really believe deeply in that if one has that opportunity. And I guess I would say, you know, the path I took was totally unrealistic. You know, in today's terms, people are always thinking, will there be a job? Well, who studies dance ethnology thinking <laughs> it's a big job? But I, I really followed something that I was quite passionate about and from a very early age. And in fact, I went to Asia and Africa on a scholarship before, you know, decades before I ever went to Europe. Um, I mean, I thought Europe's nice, but not <laughs> compared to going to Asia and Africa. You know, I, I really, I only, I think I went to, to Europe for the first time when I was about 50. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, I think following your passion and, um, and a, a, you know, I guess it's also about, about those relationships. 
you're open to relationships and and uh, experiences. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, I was talking with Joe Malillo last night and about how what an honor it is to be having the kind of job we've had with. Oh. We, we are in constant um, relationship with artists and it's a creative, you know, anyone who thinks arts administration is not creative is, is wrong. That is a creative relationship and, and trying to make sure that, trying to help facilitate an artist being able to realize their, their vision is a very, uh, uh, important part of the process of the ecology. I often think of, of the arts world as really an, a, a genuine ecology because, because no one's doing this stuff by themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything is a team. Nothing happens just because of an individual. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So I think uh, um, this was an enlightening uh, conversation. Just from listening to you, we all know that could be part two and three and, and would be much more. <laughs> Gave us an idea of an idea, but you both also are mentors and uh, people are, who listen, please reach out uh, to them and take also advantage of that of that knowledge. And for both of you, your work at the Asia Society, um, Rachel, and the networks you are engaged in, and a little bit going back to, 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 to Europe in Palermo where the mayor says, there are no foreigners in our city. There are no uh, refugees. Everybody who's in Palermo is a uh, Pal Palermian, however you say, he's a- uh, he Palermitani, absolutely. What are you talking about? He yells at people when they come up yeah. with such, uh, questions to him. Yeah. So um, there's a lot to learn. I think also Europe has a lot to learn. I think in America, the idea of diversity, the sensitivity to racism in all its form from the microaggressions, you know, from the little wars at the table, as they said about uh, Northern Ireland, you know, what happens at the, at the, the, the families on the streets, the little things, you know, you know they, they, I think that is higher here. And I think also Europe, um, uh, can, you know, also learn from that exchange, you know, that's something I think is there's yes, an understanding is taking place in the US at the moment, that is of global significance, as Elizabeth said, you know, all around the world, people followed the Floyd trial and the significance of it, and that there's some form of justice felt, and, uh, in, and as many say, you know, this uh, is, of course, not the rule, and uh, they, but it signals something, and um, as big, and we also have to be part of that change and we have to work for it. You both did in your extraordinary careers. And this is also a celebration, I think, of what you both contributed to the field. It's enormous. It has changed lives. Uh, it has helped artists to create the work at the moment, but also the following ones, it all builds to each other. It's invisible, as you also said, we often do not know. We have no idea what will come out of it, but both of you have done an extraordinary uh, contribution in the name of everybody in that big landscape. We'd like to say thank you and uh, and um, and stay engaged, stay involved, and um, and um, it's important for us to know that people with that experience, that history, are monitoring and uh, can give advice and also actively doing something because whatever you guys do, you make decisions after having presented a thousand artists over three decades or four, whatever. And that's, so this is something like, like a masterful work. It's something that a whole life is behind. So it's important, your decision, what you do and we all um, and can learn from this because you guys say this makes sense and this is meaningful. So really thank you all um, for for listening. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us. We have Milati uh, tomorrow, then we have a collaboration uh, uh, between uh, Washington and Eva, uh, two artists from, uh, uh, Switzerland and Nigeria who found a way to collaborate uh, through uh, Lincoln Center's director's lab at where they first met also in that kind of big network and Catania created. So, um, but it's a big reminder, as you said, the, listen to the artists, community, small things and big changes. There is uh, something in the arts really have to speak up now in this time if there ever was a time for the arts to show a flag and to show that we are here. We have an important thing, but people are also listening to them, it's now. And uh, that's why I feel so passionate about, about it. what we do is of significance, but we really have to listen. We really, really have to think what we are doing, what's right and what's meaningful in this time now. So both of you, thank you. And thank, thank you, you for Frank. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel.
being with us. So Rachel Elizabeth, fantastic uh, to have you with us. Uh, it's a very big honor and I uh, look forward to seeing you again more in person and collaborating and who knows what our park projects and our festival project, which is some development, you know, maybe we can also make a small contribution. Thank you all and to our listeners who uh, now have so many choices. When we started Large March, there was not so many programming online and talks so much more. So it means a lot uh, to us that you are listening. And, yeah. uh, but and it, thank uh, you for Frank, because what you're doing with the Seagull Talks is unique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Okay. Bye-bye, you guys. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.